Oh, yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so welcome to our PVSD board meeting. We do have translation available in Spanish. If you need that support, please see uh, Magdalena Maciel um, at the back of the room. And if anyone wants to speak to an agenda item, then you must complete a speaker card and hand it to Eva Renteria before the start of the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. And just as a reminder uh, from the last meeting, we, we do know that it's easy to lose track of time, um, especially if you're not accustomed to speaking in public. So rather than just cutting people off, um, Vice President Shocker will hold up a, a 30 second uh, sign just to, you know, so you can start wrapping up your thoughts uh, without being interrupted. So we will move on to um, item 3.2, our Pledge of Allegiance. Um, and I will ask uh, Trustee, Trustee Soto, would you lead us in the pledge, please? I'll let uh, Trustee Orozco get situated. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee as well. Okay. 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 I ready to begin. I okay. pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll move on to item 3.3, superintendent comments. Dr. Rodriguez, our superintendent, will make a few comments. Yes, thank you very much. So this has been a, a challenging week for all of the families within um, PVUSD. So to our students, our families, our staff, administration, and community, I'd like to ask that we join in a moment of silence for our student's um, death, which occurred on campus at Aptos High this past Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. So this was truly a senseless tragedy. Um, we have provided um, as much social emotional support as we can. I really encourage all staff, families, students that as they heal, just know that different at different times, different people are going to need those supports and we are here to support you. So please reach out, whether you are at Aptos High or at another school, please reach out and we will provide you the social emotional support that you need um, at the time in which you need it. Um, also, just on um, on another note, we do have a survey that is out. It went out yesterday that speaks to what people need in order to feel safe and cared for at school. There is both a Google um, survey and a thought exchange that allows for a more ample um, responses and um, that will be open until next Monday at 4 p.m. Um, so we encourage we already have um, almost um, well we have around 1500 responses at this point um, and we want to encourage people to continue to fill that out so that we have um, your voices heard thank you thank you dr. Rodriguez all right, on to item 3.4, governing board comments and our report on standing committee items. This is our opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Trustee Acosta. Um, I'll yield my time back for the um, moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Orozco. I just want to say uh, my deepest condolences to the family of that Aptos High School student. And I think as a community, we're all mourning the death. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Trustee DeSerpa. 
Thank you. Um, in addition to our school community who um, has suffered a great tragedy, I'm reminded that uh, three families were affected. And um, I just want to acknowledge that. I'm looking forward to our meeting on the 15th where we have a further discussion about school resource officers. And um, I want to thank and the Aptos High um, staff administration. I know it's been a very uh, rough week. And um, thank you to our administration here at the district, because I know that everybody here cares deeply about children, about our students, and keeping kids safe. And it's been um, a rough week for everybody. I'm keeping all of you in, in my heart. Thank you. Trustee Soto. Yes, good evening. Um, yeah, I too want to offer up my condolences to the families as well. It's a very, 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 very unfortunate tragedy. Um, I just came from a rosary right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to be burying my neighbor tomorrow. And at the rosary, I heard the cries of a mother. And, you know, no matter how old you are, you're always your mama's baby. And I saw that tonight. And my heart goes out to those families that were affected last week by this tragedy. You know, it's unfortunate that a woke ideology had an impression on a decision to remove SROs. There should be no question next week. We need to make the kids safe. I've heard from numerous families throughout the community to bring the SROs back. As a former police officer, former a soldier, no one up here understands, <clears throat> excuse me, public safety more than I do. This is unnecessary, it's very unfortunate, and we need to stop it. Thank you. Trustee Shocker. Just like to say, I offer my condolences to the student who lost his life on Aptos campus this past week. And as a mother myself, there is no greater tragedy, tragedy than losing a child. So I know that all of us up here want um, a solution. And so please, public, attend our meeting next week, which is September 15th at Landmark Elementary. Yes, we need to keep our children safe and make sure that we can do whatever that we can do. And we would like to hear from the public. And I'm still shook up that this incident happened and my heart goes out to the family. Thank you. You know, I've had an opportunity to speak at several town halls in the last few days and Our community was rocked by you know a horrible incident, and you know I think about you know all of the families involved, you know, however they were involved, you know, from those you know who are just have you know fellow students you know at at the school, who will have students at the school someday, and you know my heart goes out to our community, you know, particularly for the ones who are dealing with a very poignant unimaginable loss right now. And I wanted to thank our community for the outpouring of support um, for, you know, in particular for our Aptos High School students in this past week. You know, from signs and flowers, you know, when they came back to school on Friday, to local businesses that contributed, you know, meals to staff while they were grappling with what happened. All of those gestures were a spot of beauty in a very, very challenging week. And when crisis after crisis seems determined to pull, you know, our community apart, like these beautiful, gentle acts, you know, really help remind us how truly connected we are. And so for everybody who has helped out in whatever capacity you've helped out, thank you from, from the bottom of my heart. And, you know, in the spirit, you know, of, you know, that community spirit, and it's like I, I want to also acknowledge 
that we continue to have you know contributions to you know our projects that, that support the vitality of a learning space you know particularly our Emerald Agassi kitchen you know Mary E uh, Gekel Forster you know donated five thousand dollars and Margaret Gordon you know two hundred and fifty dollars Sarah Hulick a hundred dollars and all of these acts together right you know for Starlight, for Aptos High, again, it's about ways that we are, that our schools are part of our community, and our community is part of our schools. And in times like this, you know, this, this gives me hope. So again, thank you. For item 4.1, our approval of the agenda. Uh, can I have a motion to approve our agenda? We have a comment. On oh, one. on what? 4.1. Okay, great. Oh. If I could just go, I just wanted to make a simple request so that I can leave sooner. If there's no other comments on items 8.2 to 8.5, would it be possible to move 8.6 to follow 8.1? Thank you. I have one comment on this question. Okay. okay so just to clarify, Chris, you're asking to move um, 8.6 up to follow 8.2, because I do have a comment on 8.2. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I would like to make a motion to uh, approve the agenda, but I would like to make the following change. I would like to move item 8.6 up to follow 8.2. All right, and can I add just one amendment to that motion, if I may, for item 8.1. Um, if we can change the title, the title to um, approval of special board meeting on school resource officers and other safety measures, given that uh, we will be discussing not only SROs, but just what we're doing as PBU as a community to address um, safety in our schools. Will you accept that amendment? Yes, I will. All right. Do I have a second? I guess that's the second. second. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6 0. All right. Um, so, item 5.1 approval of the August 11th, 2021 board meeting minutes. Uh, can I have a motion? I'll move to approve. I have a second? I'll second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 6-0. Item 5.2, approval of the August 25th, uh, 2021 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries, 6-0. All right, moving on to item 6.1, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for the evening. And please know that the Brown Act prohibits the board from engaging in discussion for non-agendized items. That even though that is the case, we are listening. Um, do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. Okay, so I'll call the following speakers up for item 6.1, Chris Webb and Carol Turley. And you'll each have two minutes. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to express my gratitude to PVUSD for moving forward um, on actions with Renaissance's sports field. And just overall commend this board and PVUSD as models of transparency, responsiveness, and overall good government. Um, special thanks to Trustees DeSerpa, Shocker, and, and Rosco in particular for hearing the community on the sports field issue. Um, I, one concern, I've been a part of the district long enough to see that field come in and out of disrepair. And, it's, and the master plan is not fully clear to me. Um, it hasn't been presented to site leadership there. So I, I wanted to make a, a, take a moment to urge um, this kind of serious renovation that other sites have enjoyed, inclu including a possible move to a turf field. Personally, as a rugby player, I prefer grass, but since that, uh, that field is surrounded by wildlife, I worry that it's just gonna be another, in a couple years, we'll be back where we started with an unsafe field. And also, I've seen the district 
um, have public-private partnerships for other fields. So I'm thinking like with our neighbors KOA and the county, maybe we can do something like that for Renaissance. And also um, I know the local Aptos men's rugby team would, that could be a source of coming revenue. If we had a legitimate field, they could rent it from us. Practices twice a week, games on Saturdays, and then the, the district could get some return on their investment besides helping the students. And um, ideally, a restored field would be completed with ELO funds and um, support and it would be complemented with in-person instruction after school that we used to have at Renaissance. That would be a huge benefit to the Renaissance student population. Ingenuity after school doesn't serve Renaissance students well as our, as, and not as well as our old program did. Um, not grad plan wise. If, if students uh, did so well with that, they wouldn't be at Renaissance. Also, um, kudos to uh, Board President Holm on last meeting managing the most belligerent crowd I've seen. And uh, thank you to this board for doing the right thing to protect my students, to protect me, to protect my family, um, to protect even your critics. So I just want to thank you for that. Hello, trustees. I appreciate that you always um, take the time to listen to the public, regardless of what we might have to say. Um, I'm really pleased to see that everyone here today seems to be wearing a mask. That seems to have been a problem since you started having in-person meetings. Um, and going forward, if it still is a problem and you're unable to enforce that, I think you might want to consider going back to remote meetings rather than having our teachers here and our public here um, potentially being exposed. Um, it's been a few years since any of my children have been at, at Watsonville High School, um, but it seems to me that the dress code has been that students don't wear red bandanas, and I think it might be really good if the board sets an example in that. And I really look forward to Mr. Ruckert's report today on where we are with um, actuals. I find his reports to be informative and easy to follow. All right, we will move on to section seven, our employee organization uh, comments. And so now is the time where we get to hear from our employee organizations uh, and each will have five minutes. So PVFT, Nellie, go ahead. Thank you, good evening. <clears throat> I'm not gonna talk for five minutes because my voice hurts from talking with a mask on for um, the, um, a lot the last several days. Um, so good evening, board, uh, President Holm, VP Shocker, and Dr. Rodriguez. <coughs> I'm Nellie Vaquera Boggs, president of PVFT, and I realize I rarely ever introduce myself. So it's been a hard week, um, and uh, this today is just my comments are going to be short, but I do want to touch on some items. This last week, there was um, on at, uh, there was an ESSER. Uh, survey, fund survey, um, and it was to gather input on how to spend those funds. Yet in July, on the 21st of July, you had a special board meeting on ESSER funds, on how to allocate those funds. And so I'm curious to know, is this survey to override what the decisions that you made from the July 21st um, meeting. That survey was also embedded in another uh, email, in an email that had a lot of information that could easily be overlooked. So if the input is, if that survey is meant to be seeking input from the staff, then it needs to be made clear. <clears throat> and there's the other survey which um, I, that was released yesterday in regards to safety and, and, and asking questions um, in regards to that. And so I know that this might help influence where the direction on, on your upcoming special board meeting that you wanna have this next week. And I hope, we hope that you will be seeking input from um, those parties who 
shared their position last year and advocated for um, changes in, in spending. <laughs> and I hope that they are involved in this process and that it's a discussion as opposed to let's make an immediate action, um, take immediate actions on Wednesday, but to have this a thorough discussion. Health and safety is really important to us. Um, we've been advocating for this for the past 18 months. Um, and part of that health and safety is, is, you know, we're wearing masks and we're very grateful for the mask mandate. Our teachers are in classrooms um, speaking, you know, for many hours out of the day. And I just want to um, ask that our administrators know to ensure that our teachers are being given uh, mask breaks because one of the things that's coming up is um, now just we're talking all day with masks on and the, the concern of, of just our own voices and um, potential, you know, health effects to that. So ensuring that teachers have uh, a mic available to them in their classrooms, um, a handheld one that they could put up to their mouth, um, the one that you wear around your neck that can still get lost. Um, and so teachers are straining their voices to make sure that they're being heard. So that is something that has come to our attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to you meeting or seeing our chief negotiator um, in a bit and hearing what she has to say. Thanks. Thank you. All right, um, do we have anyone from CSEA? Hello, board. My name is Richard Martinez with CSCA Second VP. Actually, I didn't plan on speaking today, but I'm here, so I was able to get out of my second job a little early. Um, basically, I with CSCA, our condolences go to the families up there in Aptos, the students, and I also believe they're a community of Watsonville as well. Um, it's heartbreaking. You know, I don't know what the names of the children are, but I may have seen them through some sports or something like that. And I'm very curious too, you know, when that time comes, I feel bad for the parents. Um, CSCA was there the next day, staff at Aptos to support, and I appreciate their help up there. Um, yeah, it's a shame of what, what happened. And that's all I gotta say, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Do we have anyone from Pavam? Uh -huh. Good afternoon. President Holmes, Dr. Rodriguez, and members of the board, uh, thank you for the opportunity for uh, for us to give a short uh, overview of what happened this summer uh, in regards to migrant education. Um, but before I uh, start, I just want to say thank you to Lisa Guerrilla for actually providing the guidance and support to making sure that we had a very successful summer school program. Uh, also to the uh, uh, transportation department, human resources for all the EWAs, classifying certificated, uh, food services, then technology. Without uh, the whole team, this summer would have been uh, as successful as it was. Um, so just to, uh, to start, uh, we had the uh, opportunity to offer summer school to uh, pre-K through eight at three different sites, uh, Calabasa, Seja Hyde, and Hall. Uh, we um, actually offer services to close to 500 students in person all day. Uh, we offer math, language arts, ELD, uh, art, uh, life lab. Uh, thank you to Lisa for offering that. Uh, also to um, and Ruby Vasquez for providing some folklorical dances to our kids uh, during the summer. I also want to say thank you to Patricia and Rube, uh, Lily Diaz, and Dr. Johnny Jones for creating all the uh, curriculum that was used uh, this summer, uh, where teachers were able to access all the uh, information, all the uh, uh, lesson plans that was uh, provided to all of our migrant kids. So uh, thank you to all of you. Um, 
We also offer um, over 200 packets to migrant kids that were, were not able to actually attend summer school. Uh, and those packets uh, actually uh, included the, uh, some school supplies, uh, a small backpack, um, some math and language arts curriculum for, for our kids. Uh, we were able to hire some uh, certificated personnel, some classified personnel to uh, actually provide phone calls to make sure that the, they were following the curriculum that was offered to them through the packets. Um, also, the um, we had a very, very successful Cabrillo Summer Program. This is a program that we have offered for over 30 years. It's a cooperation between Cabrillo and Migranet. Uh, 28 students were uh, able to successfully complete the uh, program. Uh, it's a six-week program. It's a college-level class. Uh, it's taught by a college professor. Um, we were also able to provide six uh, college-level tutors that actually work with uh, small groups um, setting. Um, they work with them to make sure that the, uh, they understood the curriculum. They were able to actually understand the, uh, um, what the teacher was trying to, um, to teach. Um, they read the books. Um, uh, went over the books, and and because of that, the uh, every single student was able to complete the uh, the course. Uh, every student receives uh, ten uh, college level English credits uh, and ten elective credits at the high school level, and all three high schools were represented uh, for this program. Um, um, also, th this 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 was the first time we, that we actually offer a math and English class for the high school students um, in many years. Uh, it wasn't well attended for many reasons, but we still consider this to be a success since the uh, uh, we were able to um, hire two certificated teachers to offer the class, and some students actually uh, benefited from from actually taking the class. Um, so um, overall. Uh, like I said, the uh, thank you for providing the uh, support to my grant education uh, and for making making sure that the uh, uh, our students uh, receive the education that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have anybody from CWA? Okay. All right, we'll move on to our action items. So item 8.1, approval of special board meeting on school resource officers on September 15th, 2021. The report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes. So thank you very much. So as has been noted, um, we are going to be realigning the the title of it to include um, not only a discussion on the school resource officers, but also other safety measures. Um, as you have heard, and hopefully everyone knows, um, we did have two separate forums. So we had a forum on um, Thursday, um, September 2nd, and we also had a forum last night. Um, and um, the the forum specifically on Thursday was very, very well attended. Tuesday was not as well attended. However, it has had a lot of views since. Um, so definitely people are um, paying attention. Um, administration will be providing a range of um, not only information, but also um, options um, that the board will be able to um, that we'll be able to listen to. We will be providing the information on the um, results of the survey, the results of the um, thought exchange. I have been meeting with student groups. So today I met with about 25 of the Empower Watsonville group. Um, we're going to continue to be meeting with the groups um, that previously um, had been engaged. Um, so they invited me over there today. So I went there and was able to engage with them. Um, it's always great to see um, our student leaders in action. Um, and so um, together we'll, we'll be able to have that extensive conversation. So I'm um, recommending the approval of the special board meeting for next week. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No public speakers. All right. Um, uh, 8.2. 8.6, I don't have one for this one. Oh, uh, well, I think it's, I, I had meant to do it, but I wanted to say it. Right. Hmm. So it was not meant for 8.2? Right. It's not meant for 8.6, you mean? Your comment no. card? No. Okay. Maybe I can get some of that mask. 
<laughs> okay, so you're not speaking on restorative practices. Chris. Chris? I'll, I'll, I'll stick with Are you sure? Okay. okay thanks. Okay, we're just trying to clarify what for you. What he was saying is he wants to speak to 8.6. He meant to put something in to speak to 8.1, but maybe missed that. Yeah. So could we give him leeway and allow him to speak to 8.1, or is that for I, I agree with that right. as well. Okay. That's what I'm hearing. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to put words on your mouth. No, no, no. I appreciate you. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. So when um, PBUSD had SROs, Renaissance shared that officer with Aptos. And in my seven years with PBUSD, I never found that program to have any value for Renaissance. The officer's relationship with Renaissance was non-existent, and it was not positive enough that when I asked my students about this, the most emphatic ones are opposed. Um, Sheriff Hart mentioned lack of fights at Soquel and San Lorenzo who have resource officers. Well, Renaissance hasn't had any fights since the SRO program, has, SRO program has ended. And we're the closest high school to Aptos. So rather than SROs, I would add campus supervisors and school policies that prohibit the influence or display of symbols from unauthorized groups. For Renaissance, um, also I would say a restoration of our sports field and um, a model continuation award-winning student progress monitoring system be reinstituted. Those things could improve the kind of culture that we have and that, those, that system is a model for the entire district. Um, I doubt SROs could have prevented what happened. I think they, the most they could have done is sped response time. And um, the old progress monitoring system would have been more likely to prevent this incident and it would have documented indicators of trouble and informed teachers accordingly. And that's without spending hundreds of thousands on SROs. I'm all for having the meeting, um, but I agree with uh, Nellie in that it should be more informational and like a, a, a forum for the, the community rather than just a, a quick reaction. Um, and I think PBSD has done a good job with addressing um, demands for drugs at school with in terms of like counseling. But I think that if they were gonna bring police, it should be in the form of drug dogs, just so that we address the supply. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. And so no one else? Yeah. All right. Um, so we'll move on to board comments, and I just want to note that the, the public has a little more leeway in their comments to the board, but as a reminder, um, today what we're discussing is holding a special board meeting about the SRO issue, and just to focus our discussion around that. That being said, is there any discussion from the board? President Holm, I'd just like to go ahead and make a motion to support this agenda item. Um, I actually have a comment before we move sure. on, if that's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I noticed that um, on this agenda item, and I, I, and I believe Dr. Rodriguez also spoke to it, that it said that it's to be held at Landmark Elementary. And I, I'm understanding that's probably due to a space capacity issue and consideration here. Um, I think that maybe even a more appropriate location would be one of two. Um, either the Mellow Center or EA Hall Middle School because it does have a larger venue inside that's more spacious and open and both when the front doors and the rear doors open, there's a greater air capacity flowing through there. I know with the menu we have a JP in that, so I'm not sure of its availability, but I would think that EA Hall is subject to our request for its availability. So could we, um, I, I will gladly second the motion, but I'd like to just change the venue location to at least EA Hall. Are, are there issues with streaming? If that's possible. Um, I just, it's so, just, it's yeah, a we, better ven a larger venue. Yeah, um, I don't have any objections to changing the venue. I would just ask for the caveat that I will do so upon ensuring that we can stream from whatever location that we choose. Because I know that there is a significant group of people who wish to watch it. Sure. I don't anticipate there being any issue. I just want to make sure that I don't get us to a location where we cannot stream. So I'd be happy to, it's on the board. 
board will. I, I don't actually care location. Um, so we can definitely go to EA Hall or Mellow. I just would like it contingent on the fact that we can stream it. And if we cannot stream it, that we go to an, to either Landmark or EA Hall or the Mellow. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I just know the importance of streaming it from the comments that I've received. Absolutely agreeable. And um, I do know we have had a board meeting at the past at EA Hall. We have. So I don't and, anticipate any issues. Yeah. I just... I won't have time to make a change because it's happening next week. So I just want, we can have it at EA Hall, just contingent on I can get it streaming. And then if for some reason we can't, um, I'd be able to have well, leeway to find it. And if that were to be subject to an issue, could you look at the city chambers? We've had board meetings there in the past we, and they are reopening on the 14th. They weren't, it wasn't available. We did ask, okay. that, was, that was the first location. So I'll second. Um, um, Trustee Dodge Jr.'s motion, if you're willing to amend it, to um, changing the location to a larger venue such as EA Hall, Mellow Center. Um, I, I, Dr. Rodriguez and, and pending uh, that, that, uh, on her on Dr. On Rodriguez ability. being able to yeah. make sure it could stream or I'm willing to amend my motion to to that effect trustee you know, Costa's effect that if we could get at EA Hall or Watsonville High um, but like Superintendent Rodriguez said according to streaming issues well thank you and I'll second that do we have any other board Just comments? One comment. Okay. Dr. Rodriguez, can you make sure that we know by Friday? Because I know we've been publicizing Landmark and some parents already are planning on coming there. So if there's an issue that we yeah, can we, email we them. Yeah, definitely will. We'll, I'll, um, I'll even, we'll find out tomorrow and then I'll even text you all because I know people have been responding to emails um, and so I want to give the correct information as soon as possible. Well, it would be locked down by Friday anyways, would it not? Because if the agenda is publicized, oh, it's sure. where yeah. the location yeah, yeah, I yeah. just I, I'll just yeah. do it quicker than that. I'll do it by tomorrow. So I know many of us are well, all of us I'm sure are, are emailing people back. So thank you. <clears throat> all right. With, if there's no further comments, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Um, item 8.2, the 2020-2021 unaudited actuals board presentation by Clint Rucker. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm here tonight to present to you our 2021-2022 unaudited actuals. Um, these unaudited actuals, actually, uh, what they are, they are not a new budget. So we can, oh, I get a clicker. Love it. Cool. So it's not a new budget. This is not us presenting you with a brand new budget. What this really is is showing you our expenditures for 2020, 2021. Now, a lot of people get confused with them being called unaudited actuals. Our staff has done their due diligence to audit all of these, make sure they're as accurate as possible. The reason they're unaudited actuals is we actually have them audited, as you all know, by an independent auditor later in the year, typically around December. So right now we are um, presenting the unaudited actuals. So this is basically our estimated actuals that you saw in June at the July budget adoption. Those estimated actuals, typically staff is working on data from about the end of April. So as you can imagine, we have a lot going on between May and June. So as we kind of go through, we see POs come through, we see what we're able to purchase in time, what we're not able to be purchased in time, we make adjustments and then you end up with our unaudited actuals. So these are required to be sent to the county by September 15th. And then as I mentioned, they're reviewed by an independent auditor. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, this is, you can see, uh, a comparison of our estimated actuals to our unaudited actuals. This is for our entire general fund, both unrestricted and restricted. I wanna point out some things that you might look at and shock you, specifically revenues. So you might look at revenues and be like, you guys were off by $16 million. That seems crazy. So yes, we, we technically were off by $16 million. However, the state came out late. They came out in May and told us that there's different ways to account for funds. So I'm gonna nerd out a little bit because I do like talking about fund balance. Um, one of the ways that we account for funds is with fund balance. So that's effectively like when you get your paycheck, you put it into your savings account, that is your fund balance. It ends up being what ends up being there, regardless of if you spend it or not. We also have funds that are called unearned revenue. So a lot of you are 
familiar with Title I funding, that's unearned revenue. So what that means is as long as we spend it, we get the revenue. So as soon as we spend a dollar of Title I, they say, yes, you receive that dollar of Title I in that year. What the state ended up doing is they changed our ESSER funding from fund balance, so we want you to record it in the year that the revenue was supposed to be received, to now unearned revenue. So they said, instead, don't tell us that you earned that revenue until you spent it. So effectively, they're telling us, you do not get the money unless you spend the money. So that's why you see that big shift in revenues. Um, I'll go into some of the more details on um, why we had some differences in expenditures. But as you can see, for the most part, um, we actually do see quite a bit of um, consistency there. The revolving cash and prepaids, that's one thing I'll point out. Prepaids typically are things that, once again, we just don't know in April. So trying to make an estimate based on in April is just not possible. So really what we end up seeing is items, and I'll give a great example, Watsonville High, everyone knows they do the fireworks. So everyone knows the fireworks are in July. To get those actual purchases, we need to purchase them in June or even May to make sure we have them in time. However, because we're, it's an item that we're actually using in July, we have to account for that in the next fiscal year. So again, we don't necessarily know about those prepays until we start buying things that are really for the new year, but for whatever reason, we need to purchase them early. Um, you'll see the restrictive fund balance, that big change. Again, that's from that un unearned revenue. That's where that big $25 million is. It's not because we miscalculated. It's because instead of it being part of our fund balance, it's now moving, and it's just a different way of accounting it based on what the state required. Okay, so I'll go a little bit into revenue. Um, you'll see a little bit of a change on our LCFF sources. We found in our P2 that it actually went up, so it's good news. Always good news to see a little bit more of that um, LCFF revenue. The difference really too in that versus the other state revenue, as many of you know, we get property tax. Anything we don't get in property tax, the state backfills with their LCFF funding. So the way LCFF works, we get a set amount of our um, set dollar amount. Whatever we don't receive in property tax, they backfill up to that dollar amount. Our property taxes ended up coming in a little bit higher, so that's why you see a little bit of a shift there. And then, again, the total revenues, that decrease is Again, it looks like it's a large amount. It's really just because of that unearned revenue shift. Expenditures. So this is, again, expenditures in estimated actuals. We're looking at about what we estimated in April. So end of April through maybe beginning or middle of May, that's what we thought we would spend versus what we ended up spending with unaudited actuals. Um, certificated salaries, the big piece was actually that PVFT return to in-person uh, stipend that we ended up paying, um, the one-time payment. The reason we couldn't actually put that in estimated actuals, by the time we were doing estimated actuals, we didn't know how many teachers would sign up, how many days they would would work, how much that would actually end up accounting for. We could have accounted and guessed high or guessed low. We didn't account for it in the estimate actuals, but it was an intentional accounting um, uh, idea that we did. We didn't, it's in no way something we missed. So without that, we're actually only about 400,000 off, which is not really that bad, considering we have um, 90 million in expenditures in that category. Um, classified salaries you see is only $803 off. So I like to tease Colleen about this. Having a really close unaudited actual, if you're within probably about 1%, you're doing fantastic. If you're within that, which is about a 0.003%, you're super lucky. But really her staff did do a good job. They really did make sure that all of our extra work agreements, everything that we have out there is going to be spent. Really unaudited actuals and estimated actuals, the difference, what you end up seeing is a lot of hard work from the finance department. It's calling sites, it's asking, is this really gonna be spent? Are we really gonna make this purchase? Is it really gonna come in time? It's a lot of that. So um, you'll see some other shifts and I'll go into the expenditure shifts in a minute. So again, why is the difference? So in Revenue, we saw the state aid decrease in the property tax increase, so it's a shift. It's not really actually an increase or decrease to our overall revenue, just of where we account for it. Um, the P2 LCFF calculation did come in higher than we expected, so that was actually super beneficial to us. We actually saw about almost $2 million increase in LCFF. And then our restricted unearned revenue versus fund balance. That was really the big one in revenues. It's just seeing that we're accounting for, for it in a different way. So what you'll see at first interim, if you compare our July budget to first interim, you'll see that we actually are expecting more revenue in the restricted side now in this current year and the out years rather than last year. So it's just a shift of where we're showing the revenue come in, but it's not actually 
less revenue overall. It's the exact same revenue, just accounted for in a different fiscal year. Okay, so expenditures. So again, certificated salaries, I noted that the big change was the PVFT one-time payment. Um, with classified salaries, it comes down to EWRs that are budgeted and not spent. Again, only $800, so they did a pretty good job of keeping those on track. Um, health and welfare, when we have vacancies, we always have to budget kind of an average health and welfare. As we fill vacancies, sometimes you get somebody at a lower health and welfare, sometimes they pick a higher plan. So again, we're always trying to budget at what we think the median is. However, between an audit and an estimated, you sometimes get that shift just based on what plans individuals choose. Um, books and supplies, we saw a shift between textbooks and software. So you'll have seen on the other slide the 5,000 and the 4,000 change. Part of that is simply because we think we're going to buy textbooks and somebody puts in a PO to buy $300,000 worth of some sort of textbook. It turns out instead it's actually going to be an online textbook or online learning. That actually has to get shifted to a different account code. So that actually gets shifted to um, your 5,000s rather than your 4,000. So most of that when we looked into it, that's where it came from was those shifts. We also had some unfilled purchase orders. Again, despite our best efforts, we asked a site, are we going to get these, you know, 100 Chromebooks we ordered? We asked the vendor, are they coming before June? They say, absolutely, they're coming June 15th, and then we get a call on June 15th. They'll probably be there like July 15th, and we're like, okay, that, that changes our budget quite a bit. So again, it's not necessarily things that you won't see spent in the out years or next, or really this year. It's just things that we weren't able to receive in time to be able to account for them. And then services and operating expenditures. The big one you'll see on that, um, on the restricted, is actually the paging systems. We had some of those completed earlier than expected. And then Michael's Transportation, as all, you all remember, we did that contract late for summer school because we knew we had that um, decrease in what we were going to get in terms of drivers for summer school. So again, when we, when we do a contract in May, um, it's, it's tough to be able to anticipate that in April. And then field turf sediment, we paid for that um, that finalization. As you know, we started EA Hall. Everything is now settled with them, so we did have to end up putting that in uh, that payment in at the last minute. And then lastly was capital outlay. As you all know, you approved those shade structures in May. Well, estimated actuals were done in you know an end of April, beginning of May. So we did not know if those IPI, you know, using that IPI funding, if those shade structures would be completed before July. So any that were done or any work that had to begin before July, we did have to pay in that fiscal year. So again, you'll see that shift at first interim that there'll be less actually accounted for in 21-22 because we actually had to pay it in 2021. So what does it all mean? So I know one trustee um, will probably ask me, what is the average of a district or what do most districts end up seeing in their unaudited actuals? So for expenditures, typically you see about a 1% variance. If you're in within that 1% variance or around that 1% variance, that's what, when, when looking at some of the um, big names in California finance, FICMAT, school services, they say if you're in about 1%, you're doing well. So we were at about 1.1%. Now, that's without taking into account that we kind of knew that one-time bonus was going to get paid. If we ignore that piece, because again, we, we, we could have added it, could not have, we kind of went with the not adding it. We were only 0.3% off on our expenditures. So pretty huge for having a you know $290 million budget to only be off that much. So. Um, and really what it highlights is the hard work of the finance department. So I know I've told you all many times, I am not the only one who does this work, really. There's a lot of hard workers who are doing a lot of the legwork, a lot of the really nitty gritty, talking to the sites, making sure everything's accounted for. And that is our finance team. So I am gonna, I specifically took a little bit of extra time on my presentation so I can give them all a shout out. Cause really I feel like finance a lot of times are kind of those unsung heroes. They usually are the ones providing the bad news of we don't have money for that or you can't buy that. No, that's not allowed. So I think it's important to recognize their hard work. So Colleen Bugayong, who is the um, Director of Fiscal Services, she's here with us tonight. And then her staff, Teresa Battle, our staff accountant, Sherry Bowers, our MA LEA coordinator and of special projects. Carmen Calderon, who is our senior staff accountant. Big props to Carmen. I think I saw her leaving at eight o'clock a few times during um, 
the creation of Unaudited Actuals. Olga Castro, our staff accountant, Vicki Davis, our staff accountant, Erica Padilla, staff accountant, and Margarita Ponce, staff accountant. So again, a lot of people go into this work and a lot of people put in the hard work. Um, appreciate all of those staff members, the majority of them being CSCA staff members, so appreciation to CSCA and all their hard work. So looking forward, we're going to look at first interim. As you all know, we have our July budget. Next up is unaudited actuals, which I'm doing now. Then we move into first interim. First interim, again, being not a budget, but an update of where we are. It's really an update then of our expenditures through October. So in first interim, we see kind of the similar challenges you've probably all heard me echo multiple times. One is PERS and STIRS. Those rates continue to rise, and we're not actually seeing relief from the state like we did in prior years. Um, COVID-19, I'm sure you've all heard about it. It's kind of a big deal. Um, it's also something that's so unexpected. I mean, each day I think we're dealing with more and more unexpected um, consequences from COVID-19. We have to start doing, you know, as we started it, we had to start disinfecting. Nobody ever thought we'd be disinfecting classrooms every night with an electrostatic sprayer. That was not in our mind. So we don't know what challenges will face us moving forward, what expenditures might come up throughout the year as we're trying to face um, face off the virus. One-time funding and new revenues with new expenditures. So these kind of go together. Again, that one-time funding is tough. Um, you'll see actually in the review, um, the COE typically does of our budget, that one of their concerns, and it's not with us, it's with every district, it's really all districts in California, is one-time funding does a great job of masking problems. Because you get a lot of one-time money and you think, hey look, we have tons of fund balance, we're fine, everything's good. But it really hides the fact that, no, we do still need to be diligent. We do have declining enrollment coming. We do need to pay attention to that. We've already you know, accounted for declining enrollment. We know that's in our budget. But we do have to be careful that that one-time money will eventually run out. And we just need to be aware that we are declining enrollment. How do we make sure we right size as, as the years go on? And then, of course, health and welfare benefits. Um, probably sound like a broken record, but it is a large amount. If you saw it, it was over $80 million in just health and welfare. So again, when about 90% of our budget is salary and benefits, benefits having no cap, being able to rise like they do, it's just a concern we always want to look out for because as we know with COVID, we kind of had that break because not many people went to the hospital or used me uh, medical facilities. Now it's kind of shifting and everybody's back in the hospital. My wife likes to tell me all the time, she says, they're calling me again, do you want me to go in and work? I'm like, how many people do they need? She's like, they need like four nurses tonight. I'm like, oh, that's a lot. Um, yeah, I guess you probably should. So I, I see it firsthand at home that she's getting a lot more patients than she used to. The hospitals are definitely getting flooded more than they used to. So what are our next steps? So after an audited actuals, as I noted, we go to first interim. That'll be by December 15th. You'll see that presented. Um, we have our annual independent audit. So again, the auditors typically come about September, October, and then they do their independent audit presentation in December um, for the board. Then we have the governor's budget in January. So that's the new budget for the next year. Kind of see what's to come. What is he doing with COLA? What should we expect for our upcoming years? We do our second interim by March 15th. And then we, of course, have that governor's May revise where sometimes we get really great news and sometimes we get completely awful news. So hoping this year we see great news from that one again. And then lastly, we'll do our July budget adoption. And as crazy as it sounds, then we're back again through a whole nother year. So um, with that, uh, we do request that you approve unaudited actuals as they were presented. And I will be happily answer any questions. Thank you, Clint. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, I have two. Um, first speaker, Bill Beecher. Good evening, Madam, <coughs> Madam President, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, and the rest of you guys. Um, I want to address the health care costs. They used to be 60 million, now he's talking about 80 million. Uh, in the past, I'd asked to have this agendized that we look at uh, our health care uh, process. So tonight I've, I've uh, provided a formal request for information on our health plan for the last three years. I'd like to know the annual plan, plan premiums, the annual claims, which gives us an efficiency of how well our money's being spent. The number of participants, I believe that probably close to 4,000. What PVUSD overhead costs do we have on top of 
what were charged from the uh, carrier and then the name of the carrier and their address because I'd like to do a look at their business and uh, see how well they're doing as a business. So thank you for your assistance. I'm sorry you haven't been able to agendize this, nor have you told me you would or wouldn't. Thank you, Bill. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Um, I am the Chief Negotiator for PVFT, and I just would like to make a couple of comments and observations about the interim report. Um, the first thing I would just like to point out, though, is the listed PVFT bonus was not a bonus. Um, additionally, that was not a stipend for going in person. That was a stipend for our teachers who chose to provide additional work to students beyond what was required of distance learning for the 2020 school year. So I just want to clarify that for the public and for the board. Um, and I'd also just like to point out that that money was not from our general fund, but was actually used from our uh, ELO monies, which provided for that additional services for students. That was one-time monies that the district received. So I just want, feel like that's important for you guys to know. Um, a couple of other observations I'd like to make. Um, one is in the actual SARC report, that there is on the employee benefits column, which is 3501 to 3502, there is an increase to the unemployment insurance by $1.4 million. And I question what that increase is for, as that inflates the total benefits of units and uh, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense in comparing it to our 2021 actuals. The other thing I'd like to bring up is on page 135 on the items 1,000, thank you, to 199. Uh, I know we like to say that 90% of our budget goes to salaries and benefits, um, but if you look, it's under Ed Code 41372. Um, there is a percentage amount that districts are required to provide for salaries and benefits to classroom employees and that minimum for unified school districts is 55 percent and in the last one two three four five years the district has consistently spent not more than 55 point something percent so that is the bare minimum that they can provide um, and i just like to point that out as we know we are currently still faced with many vacancies Did you want to um, answer that question about the? Did you have a question? I think we have to ask the question. Okay. We have to ask the question. Are there any other <laughs> public comments? No more public okay. comments. Okay. No. But Kim has a question. Yeah. I do have a question, Clint. Sure. <laughs> So it's been my understanding, I've been on this board 11 years, it's been my understanding that we are paying somewhere above 80% for salaries and benefits. As Correct. Uh, Correct, depending on which accounts you look for, it's between 87 and 90%. Yeah. So where do you think the 55% um, so is coming from? So it, the it, actual salaries without benefits? So the 55% yeah. comes from actual positions coded as instructional in-classroom positions. So to clarify, this does not include positions like psychologists, does not include SLPs, it does not include a lot of our reading intervention teachers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different teachers that do not fall into that exact um, instructional category. Yeah. Counselors do not, social emotional counselors. So there's a lot of pieces that don't fall into that. That is strictly in classroom teachers. So that doesn't leave a lot of money left over for facilities or extracurriculars or? No, no. Um, again, most school districts face the problem of, you know, when we're looking at trying to provide additional um, supports to our classrooms, to our um, teachers, to our classified individuals, when 90% of our budget is tied up already, mm -hmm. there leaves very little for textbooks, for facilities, for supplies. Transportation, yeah. yeah. Okay. Congratulations on the very small variance. Colleen, you're doing a great job. Really, thank you. 
And Clint, could you clarify, you know, because the issue about the um, unemployment insurance, because that was a question yeah, I had had as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it does look shockingly off. Unemployment increased in California by 3,000%. So it was not doubled, it was not tripled, 3,000% increase. So it went from um, roughly 0 0.005 to 1.24 is what it did, up to. We did see now that for schools they are going to drop it down to 0 0.05, still almost 250% uh, increase for us. But yeah, they, they did they did actually have that big of an increase. Um, what happened is with COVID and so much unemployment, California burned through the majority of their reserves in unemployment. So in order to get them back, they have this great idea of we'll just charge a ton in one year, and in one year, we'll have our reserve back. So that is an employer cost for all employers, not just school districts, but really any employer that um, pays into unemployment insurance, it went up astronomically. Thank you. Do I have any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, seeing none, I'll enter. Uh, oh. Just really quick, you know, just to address the, the, the last point uh, made. Um, when, when we're referring to a bonus versus not bonus, I think it's, it's good to just use the language and explain what that is moving forward. Just because um, it's an issue out in the community. Right. Um, oh, teachers are receiving a bonus. Why are we not receiving a bonus? So I think that is an excellent point that moving forward, we just need to clarify and call it what it is. Absolutely. Uh, um, but aside from that, thank you for this presentation and congratulations to you and your team. It's really them. They do all the hard work. All right. If there's no further comments, we'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. We have um, six in favor, uh, one opposed. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're moving to what was item 8.6, uh, restorative practices. The report will be presented by Rick Ito, our Director of Student Services. All right, is this on? Yeah, okay. Fairly cool, okay. Good evening, Board President Home, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. My name is Ricky, I'm the Director of Student Services. Thank you for having me here tonight. Tonight I want to briefly talk to you about bringing restorative practices to PVUSD schools. So the fundamental hypothesis, human beings are happier, more productive, and more likely to make positive changes when people do things with them rather than to or for them. This is just another quote that expands on what I just mentioned. It just talks about engaging with young people, working with them. And this is just a visual for you to look at. We want to be in the upper right-hand quadrant working with students during this time. Implementing restorative practices. When we reconceptualize discipline to address and repair rather than punish, we, we see a reduction in discipline referrals, serious incidents, and punitive and exclusionary discipline responses. When school connectedness improves, we see improved school attendance, test scores, and graduation rates. Students have mentioned that have worked or that have been at schools with restorative practices, the list that I have there, but they've also mentioned mutual feelings of respect and trust, justice and fairness in school, and a sense of belonging. The schools that we decided to work with this fall are New School, Renaissance High School, and Pajaro Middle School. As you can see that we'll be working with the entire staffs. So we'll be working with the administration, the socio-emotional counselors, campus security, and the teachers. Other schools will be have their socio-emotional counselors and site administrators invited to the trainings so that we may start the process with other schools in the spring. When, as we train the staffs over at the three schools, we start with restorative responses. And this is effective statements, effective questioning, reflective listening, and responding to resistance. 
and these are some of the questions and the techniques that they'll be taught or trained in at each of the sites. These are just some open and closed questions that they'll also be taught how to use when working with students. The continuum of practices is the proactive approach. So this is building community. So this is in the classrooms. They'll be learning how to implement circles and other community building activities. And these can be used in all different ways, check in and check outs, uh, classroom norms, content goals. Uh, as the students become more comfortable in circles, there will be responses to wrongdoing and they are taking a proactive approach in discussing issues that may be um, arising or possibly could be happening on campus. This is the continuum of practice. This is responsive. So sites will be trained in um, small impromptu conferences. And usually that will just be a, you know, a counselor, maybe a teacher and uh, the students. And then there are more formal conferences, restorative conferencing and family group decision making. The third area that they're gonna be trained in is harm repair. So in a case where there's you know, a significant incident that happens on campus, what traditionally would happen is we would suspend or we would separate or isolate kids or maybe even a change of environment. But with restorative practices, after a significant incident, these are the areas that will be used. So there's pre-conference, there's obviously listening for the insight, getting to the root of the incident, um, you know, talking to the people that are most effective, Having act, everyone will have active voices, they'll respect voices, there'll be a, prom a promotion of unity, and then they'll come up, they'll brainstorm ideas to repair the relationship. And I think the important thing with uh, restorative practice is attending to the needs of the affected people. Restorative practices, simply put, to be restorative means to believe that decisions are best made and conflicts are best resolved by those most directly involved in them. The restorative practices movement seeks to develop a good relationship and restore a sense of community in an increasingly disconnected world. Oops, sorry. That's the quote. And that's it. Thank you, Rick. Do we have any public speakers to that item? Yes, please, Chris Webb. Okay, so I, um, I think the reason the district chose Renaissance is they know it's a fertile ground for this type of uh, system, and that's because of our traditional student progress monitoring system, which included a, a comprehensive structure that included a lot of this. And um, I guess the reason I'm here is because our, our last admin was against that system, and our current admin has quietly killed it with the pandemic, um, and there was no kind of information to the, to the staff at all, let alone light, site leadership. And um, we've got these site wellness teams in place, but they're not, they're not as effective. They, do, they, document, uh, they document issues more than correct them. And they're not as, the stakeholders are not as involved. Uh, the, the system that we had was WASC approved and it won us model continuation school. It was an effective program. I, f I feel like basically now we're, we're if, we're, if I can make a baking analogy, we're like using skim milk when we were using whole milk and our cake is not as good. So I, I feel like we should keep our system that we have and use these ideologies like um, restorative practices and PBIS to make them better because we already have such strong roots. Um, I, I also feel that this would, this would do a lot to improve uh, school climate. I remember when, when we, when this system was first under attack, and I left on a leave. When I came back, I had people or students kind of threatening me for for wearing the wrong color and stuff. And and there was the expectations, the standards were so much more clear with our old system. I, and I feel like if our, our our admin, because they don't have the blessing of somewhere in this building. They've, they've been hostile to that successful, effective program. So I would like to see that program restored and made a model for other okay. sites. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments? 
Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, I have Gard? a question. M Mr. Ito, what do I tell my constituents in my district where people are saying they're noticing an increase in fights at E Hall and Watsonville High? Well, I think that, I mean, you know, part of restorative practice is building community. So, you know, hopefully the, those issues can be addressed before they happen. And that's why, you know, we want to train staff in using circles so that students feel like they have a place where they could express themselves and talk about issues prior to them happening. So, you know, it's not, I'm not saying that, you know, there may be an incident, but it's mm -hmm. how it's handled also after is also restorative ways. So we look at harm repair and we look at different areas. So there is, it's kind of, it's twofold. I'm hoping that we're able to prevent through um, circles and having that connectedness to the school. And also um, if there are issues that we do follow through with the harm repair so that um, you know, the involved parties understand the ramifications and how it affected school, community, mm -hmm. class, everyone. The, the only reason why I ask, I know we've only been in school a couple of weeks, and I know I have a a nephew at E Hall, and you know he's reported, and I've seen cameras, you know, footage of multiple fights in E Hall, and I've also seen reports from Watsonville High School, and, and I just want to know where we we talk about restorative justice, but you hear these reports, and we've only been in school for a month, so I just wanted to. Yeah, and I think to, to further kind of explain, I think what we've all experienced and been watching in, not just similar to our district, but in multiple districts, we have kids that have been out of school for 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I think part of coming back and setting some of those expectations and moving through PBIS and resetting some of those foundations, um, it's also important to be patient but approach it from both sides. So yes, in terms of discipline actions and consequences, that is one function of the school district and we are using those measures within the needs of what we have. But we also know that that's not the cure mm -hmm. and it's not the answer. So tonight really the focus point of, of where we're going in terms of looking at these restorative practices are to get our kids to be a part of that conversation. So the restorative line as, as Mr. Ito has presented is really about engaging the kids to help look at the solutions and help that harm repair. We know that every time an adult steps into that mix and we solve it for them or we separate them or whatever the case may be, and, and we're not talking about just fights, this happens on our playgrounds in elementary school every day. When, when we steal swings from each other, it starts that young with those primary things and our kids not knowing how to approach each other when they feel like they've been wronged. So a lot of these restorative pieces that we're talking about is engaging the kids in this level. It's not just the level of training staff to de-escalate and have those conversations with kids. It's about opening up those venues and asking the right questions so that our kids can be part of the voice in that. We talk a lot about student voice, but not when it comes to discipline, consequences, expectations. And that really is the drive behind looking at a restorative function um, and going through three of our schools currently and then kind of moving from there depending on what we see. But it's practicing and it's getting our kids back to the habit of it. This is highly um, engaging with parents as well, so they're a part of the process. And I think it's really just providing those examples to our kids that when we have wronged somebody that there is a correct way to be able to approach that versus a combative way. So this really is the proactive response to it. It doesn't negate the issues that we would have on discipline with consequences. But, um, I, I support this, but I, I just wanted to bring out loud the, the concerns that my constituency is having, and I just wanted you to explain, but thank you very much. Uh, I, just in terms of, you know, we had a, a comment about, you know, previous practices. Can you talk a little bit, you know, address that a little bit? Just why this one in particular? Sure, and there's multiple measures. There's not just one and done in terms of what works. Um, the leveling system that, that Chris is referring is one area of focus. Um, I will say that the loss of points, so it does work on a, a structure of points within that system, that loss of points actually is not considered a restorative function. So um, I, I do agree that there are things in leveling systems and other things that help and benefit, but this is, is much more in alignment with a restorative function of students actually being 
able to communicate and speak with them. I will absolutely agree that they are fertile ground for us to be able to, to work with in terms of uh, teacher support and drive to be able to also assist kids in having those conversations with each other, um, but, but certainly in alignment with uh, where we're going in the restorative function, this is a complement to those pieces that are already happening. Thank you. Yeah. So I just, a question is, how were the three schools selected? So the three schools were selected because New School and Renaissance both started um, some preliminary restorative practices prior to the pandemic. So they did do some training with the county and with um, Julius Mills Denty okay. prior to. And then we chose Pajaro Middle School because it was a smaller uh, middle school at the time the enrollment was is a little bit lower than some of the other secondary um, schools and also at that time when we chose them they had a stable administrative staff there uh, since uh, Miss Padilla moved over to the high school but Mr. Harris is still very much in favor of it and they also had a socio-emotional counselor there Jules Reynolds who is very much in favor of it so that's the other component of it is that um, Tierney over at New School and Matt over at Renaissance are both very enthusiastic about um, learning about this and being trained in this. Okay. And can you define what a significant incident is for harm repair? Um, well, it would be anything that, um, you know, a fight is, would be a significant incident, okay. anything above that. Um, it just depends on how the people were affected, but uh, yeah. Okay, so automatically a fight is considered harm, so. Yeah. You go on. Well, there's, and there's also, you know, there's different situations too where, you know, people are affected. It could be, you know, um, comments that are made, mm -hmm. right? So restorative practices are really looking at who's affected and how we can make it right and listen to how they're affect, how the people were affected and how it affected, like I said, the classroom, the school, okay. you know, the community. Right. And so you want to repair that harm. And that's the important thing about it. I mean, there are going to be, you know, incidents that happen, but there's always going to need to be some kind of repair after. And that's where I think we don't, you know, when traditionally we suspend and we don't, you know, do anything. This right. is more about re repairing that harm. Okay. Yeah, and listening to the affected. Okay, do we have plans to move this into elementary? We knew you guys were going to ask that too. So uh, similar to what we've done within curriculum, it's the same concept. So whenever we run something, whether it is social, emotional, whether it's restorative practices, it runs really the same course, which means we're going to um, use these specific schools. We're going to definitely go through the staff and get feedback from the staff, from the kids at these levels as well. You know, uh, assuming that all goes as, as planned, as we know it has worked for other school districts as well, um, what we'll basically do is probably be coming back and giving you another list of our next three. Um, by choice within all of these schools, there is a commitment from the social emotional counselors, the mental health clinicians, and the principals of those schools to help with the rollout at other schools if we find it to be successful. Okay. And then just to um, go into one of the comments that was made, can we make sure um, just do a check in with our wellness teams at, t at sites and make sure that they're connecting and not just documenting? Yes, I will pro provide an update to you guys with that. Thank you. Trustee DeSerpa? I have a question. Um, so can you, it, can you talk to us about, so there's three small pilots, which I think are the perfect pilots for this program. I love this program. Um, and then what would be the plan if it's successful to piloting up to scale? So what we're doing is, um, with the three schools, we want to train, like you know, Chris said, about uh, train the socio-emotional counselors, the administration, myself, and then keep this in-house. So at some point, you know, Julius would just be consulting, and then he would slowly not be part of it, and then we have an in-house team. Mm -hmm. So that's what our plan is: to form an in-house team, so that that team could go to the next three schools and help them train and add more people to the team and then just keep going and adding schools as we go along the way. So we want to be less dependent on any outside consultants or anybody and be able to train the schools within. Okay, thank you. Trustee Orozco? Yeah, for when we uh, go through a suspension or um, kids are referred to us for expulsion, there's usually, um, some you know recommendations that you know it's a suspended exposure with placement at a different school and usually for those students there's a plan in place 
that they need to meet certain requirements, right? And and part of that, it's often working with Valor and other support services and, you know, getting the entire family involved in certain situations. Um, so how would this model um, impact or be involved with that process? So twofold, it actually benefits us prior to an expulsion. So that's actually the first goal, which is to get into a place of us being able to really have the kids in front of each other, the families be able to be a part of the process as well, um, prior to even getting to that part. Where it fits in the expulsion line is that you would likely, especially with the schools that are in the process, you would see indication if a family has declined the restorative function of it or if a student has refused. All of these are contingent. You, you can't force somebody to repair harm that they've done. You can't force somebody to apologize. So all of these are really contingent upon how much the family as well as the student is willing to come to the table and have those conversations. Similar to if you were to think of it as a parallel route for adults would be looking at a mediation cycle or something that would allow them to be able to still have voice, have their feelings heard, but in a way that is actually actually controlled and appropriate. So it certainly fits within that repair of harm. You'll see it in some recommendations potentially moving forward as, well, let's hope not in terms of the number of expulsions, but um, it, it is very likely that you will see that interwoven. And if not, you would see within records that that was a decline as well. So this would be considered a corrective measure. So when we talk about violations, these are things that we can put in place to help support our kids to change the action versus continuing it. So similar to what Mr. Ito was saying in regards to suspension and then not doing something after, that actually puts our kids in a really vulnerable spot. What have they learned in that process? So re-entry, those pieces of what can we do to repair are gonna be pretty critical. Um, and it also provides a grounds for what we call corrective measures, which means we have tried other things to be able to kind of jog the situation and help a student understand and really educate themselves on what they've done so that they can help rectify it in a positive manner versus just the discipline consequence. And one of the things I really like about this is that um, it includes the entire family to a certain level. And um, I feel that's probably a better approach uh, because you're reinforcing what you're learning, what you're being taught, what you're practicing in school um, at home. Um, and also getting the parents engaged, right? Um, so thank you for bringing this forward. If there's no further comments, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. A second. second. A first Sorry. and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So going back to item 8.3, uh, resolution 212209, uh, GAN limit. Clint, back to you. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, each year, the district is actually required to do this resolution known as the GAN limit resolution. Back in 1979, actually, they passed a law um, named after GAN, which is where the name comes from, that effectively a public entity cannot increase its expenditures more than what was originally set in 1970 and then adjusted for inflation and cost of living adjustment. So what we have to do every year is show that for us as our local taxes that we haven't exceeded that limit and then we have to report to the state what our total cost was so that they can take into account for their, um, again for the LCFF calculation and their state aid they provide us, that they too are staying within the GAN, uh, GAN limit. The state's GAN limit I believe is around $2.6 billion. Um, our local one is about uh, 140000 140,000 and we only bring in about 80,000 or, or sorry 140 million we only bring in about 80 million or so 82 million so we're well below our limit we've never really come near it but again we do have to do this each year bring it to the board the board does have to approve it so that we can uh, submit it to the state so they know then for their calculations how much they have to contribute and ensure that they don't go over that limit so um, although this is a resolution it's a resolution we do every single year for the GAM limit calculation just to ensure that we are following um, the statutory law of California. So with that, I request that the board approve this resolution. Thank you, Clint. Do we have any uh, board comments? I'll entertain a motion, if not. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. 
I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries uh, 601. Thank you. All right. And moving on to item 8.4, Migrant Seasonal Head Start Salary Schedules. Uh, the report will be presented by Allison Niazawa. Not bad. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so as in the item, we have some salary schedules for you that are being brought. Um, they are, as noted, they are part of the original TA that we had with PVFT about a year and a half ago. Um, but in working with the county and um, their recommendation to bring these back to the to the board to have them uh, approved so that when, if we were to get an audit from STRS, um, instead of, even though we have all the documents to prove that this was what a year would be of service credit and all that for our, for our CDD and Migrant Seasonal Head Start employees, that by just looking at the salary schedule, they would be able to determine um, years of service and whatnot, and so it's it's just some cleanup language on on the salary schedule. So I move or request that you approve these tonight. Thank you. Any comments from the board? Go ahead, Trustee Dodge. Uh, I, I would just like to say I'd like to make a motion to support this agenda item, and I also like to say thank you to the family and child care home specialists that make this happen. You know, even during the pandemic, they were still watching, you know, our children and, you know, risking their households and their families. And so I would like to make a motion to support this agenda item. Right. Uh, Trustee uh, Acosta? Um, I will second Trustee Dodge Jr.'s motion and, um, <clears throat> and all that he said. Very much so. Thank you. All right, uh, Trustee Shocker. Yeah. Um, so I sit on Migrant Head Start Committee, and the salary schedules is one of the things that we've been discussing in committee. And this is a step that is definitely needed in order for us to maintain our child care homes um, because they could choose to go with other um, county run programs and make more money. So um, this is just vital to keep children in homes that work with them and take care of them and offer them pr proper nutrition and a, a safe place to stay. So thank you to those supporting us tonight. If there are no other comments, I have a first and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we will move on to 8.5, approved memorandum of understanding with CSCA Chapter 132 uh, and PVSD regarding transportation bus driver signing bonus. Allison, still you. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So before you tonight, we have an MOU with our CSCA Chapter 132 um, to bring forth a MOU for a signing bonus for bus drivers. So this would include, or this would be for fully um, certified bus drivers, so not our trainees, but people coming to the the district that are fully ready to start driving a bus um, right from hire. Um, in typical, or not typical, but some of our other um, signing bonuses we've done with, with PVFT, there is a, a payout um, Timeline. So they, as it says there, they would they would receive their first payment after or their first payment of 500 for, after the first six months of employment, and then receive the remainder 1,000 upon completing a full year with us to um, kind of encourage them to also stay with us as well. So uh, I request that you approve this for us tonight. Thank you, uh, Trustee Acosta. Um, so I do. Hi, Allison. Thank you. Um, I I do have a couple of questions. Um, you said, so this is just strictly for those that come to us already fully credentialed and licensed to start driving, not those that enter for our training program. Was there, is there a special reason for that and why there was no consideration for something additional I think for we were really new coming in training something yeah I, I think the intention was that we are we need drivers like today we need them right now right. and and so the to entice those that might be out there to come to our district fully certified so that we can get them in buses and driving because that is really what the need is um, and I know the training program is, is helpful as well but we have such a need um, it was to try to attract fully licensed bus drivers and what is the current time frame taking right now about with our new, uh, those coming in to the training, training program? program. Oh, roughly. I think it's a few. Six. Okay, it's about three months. Yeah, I was going to say, okay, I was right. Yeah. Yeah. Three, three to four yeah. months. Yeah. 
And so is there a possibility to look at, I understand the need of now mm -hmm. and the moment and this, and but is there something that we could look at to entice more also within the training program? Absolutely. I mean, this is just, this has a time limit on it. It's it's not forever and ever. And just as we've done with, with other bargaining units and other um, signing bonuses, we've adapted them over the years to feed, to fit our needs at the time. And so if we, you know, end up getting fully staffed and we want to grow that program, we could see it expanding it at that time if that's what our needs are as a district. I, I guess because I'm also recognizing, you know, a force that we're also dealing with, right, is our metro system, which I'm not sure if you're both aware of, right, is currently actually offering signing bonus packages I think that are greater than this and the credentialing requirement is less in that system right than it is for a certified and licensed school bus drivers so that's some of the reality of the competition that we're dealing with mm -hmm. so I just I mean I'm fully supportive of this and I'll make a motion to to um, um, into that effect to support it. I'm sorry, a motion to approve it, excuse me. But I would really certainly like to see if we could do something maybe to entice within the training program because it is, there is so much more, a, a higher bar to be a certified and licensed school bus driver in the state of California than to be a Metro driver. And if Metro is offering bonuses, you know, with that less bar, mm -hmm. That's, that's what we're dealing with on a competition level, right here in our own community. Yeah. So I just think that's important if we could look at it. So, so well, um, you know, Allison works really well with CSCA. I'm sure we could bring up the conversation. I think this is, as she's mentioning, this is a good first step. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, we'll talk about need and um, if it's uh, something that we all um, can agree on and we feel there's a need, we'll, we'll definitely bring back a second MOU. Yeah, and if you could at least just update us, maybe in some time if, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. where that conversation is. Sure, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you have my first. So any, uh, Trustee Dodge Jr.? Uh, yeah, I just like, it's more like a comment. Are, are we doing anything to keep these employees? Because I know we've had previous trouble keeping the bus drivers. You know, I, you know, what I remember, they were just coming, getting the training, and then leaving. Are, are, we, are we trying to do anything to say, like, hey, you know, we have these bonuses, we have this money, but like, could you consider, or there's any type of wording that says, but you know, we like to keep you, or to, in order to get these bonuses, you have to stay with the district? So that's what I, you, that's what we wrote in there as a, as a way to, to work on that a little bit, right? Is that yeah. they wouldn't get their first payment until six months in, so okay, they couldn't, you know, stay with us for three months, take their 1500 and be like, thank you, I got the yeah. training, and I'm, and I'm out. I'm leaving to, to Metro or, or Co something. Correct, correct, as well as to, to Trustee Acosta's point of, you know, looking at trainees but these would be also fully licensed bus drivers so that that wouldn't be necessarily a training up piece for them yeah but I, I do understand what you're saying so and then the other piece of getting the larger sum of it after after one year so we've been trying to to weave those into our MOUs as at the board direction right of, of how can we try to keep them as long yeah. as, as we can. well you know I mean we want them to stay Absolutely. so Come and work for PUSD and come stand with us, please. So, <laughs> so, so with that, I would like to second Trustee Acosta's and, motion. You know, and just to add on to that, so a lot of these types of, you know, you spoke to that component, right? And, and so the Trustee Dodge Jr., come, train, you know, thank you, got my bonus three months later, out. I'm going to Salinas, Gilroy, Monterey. Some of these programs, like, they'll look to extend that 18 months, 24 months. It's a very reasonable time to consider in asking when we're investing, especially if it's a training program, we're investing mm -hmm. in training you, and then also if we're giving you a signing bonus on top of that, to ask mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a soul for 18 to 24 months of their life, that's a very reasonable time frame. Mm -hmm. No, we, like, I, like I said, it's definitely, uh, it's our first step in, in offering a signing bonus for our for a classified unit and or for transportation. It's definitely, depending on the success of it, we can look into other other um, opportunities or other ideas to, to retain them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustee Orozco. Um, <clears throat> Trustee Acosta addressed what I was about to okay. say. So we're good. All right. Are there any further comments then? We have a first and a second. All right, hearing none, I'll entertain the vote. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, going on to item 8.7, approve a uh, new high school course, uh, Baile Folklorico, and the report will be presented by Lisa Aguirre-Lewis. <laughs>
Thank you. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. This evening, um, I'm asking for approval of a new course, um, high school course, Baile Folklorico. Uh, this past fall, Watsonville High School had a need to expand its offerings in, within the electives and the, specifically the visual and performing arts. The administration reached out to Cabrillo College, and together they um, partnered to collaborate on developing a course specifically for high school students that will be offered at the Watsonville Cabrillo campus Campus, and it's, Cabri um, it's the Baile Forclorico. Um, students will receive, it's a dual enrollment class, so students will receive both high school credit and also um, college credit. So it gives the students opportunity to interact in, within a, a college, on a college campus within a, and getting their career started. And um, with that, I ask for your approval for the addition of a new high school course. Uh, Trustee Orozco. I'd like to make a motion to approve this item. This is so exciting. It's very exciting. Um, and it, it's, it's good that we're, um, again, continuing to expand um, our collaboration with the Rio College. So I think our students would definitely benefit from something like this. All right, anyone else? I'll yep. second. It's All right. very exciting. And this is lovely. Yeah. yeah. It's a great opportunity for our students. Yeah. So, um, Tr Trustee Holm, can I make oh. a quick comment? Sure, I, I just, I anything we can do to help our high school children, PVSD children, get a jump into a community college, mm -hmm. how can we not be for it? Thank you. All right. We have a, uh, uh, Trustee DeSerpa, did you have something you wanted to ask? Nope, I, oh. I made a second. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw the mic still on, so. Um, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 8.8, uh, .8, approve resolution 2122-11, recognizing Latinx Heritage Month. Still you. All right. Uh, good evening, um, President Home Board Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez once again. Um, this evening, um, I'm presenting to you resolution number 2122-11, recognizing September 15th through October 15th, 2021 as Latinx Heritage Month. This is the fifth year that I'm presenting this resolution in front of you. In the beginning, um, we rightfully had push from some of our community members to put action into words. Um, in the time since I first appeared in front of the board, we have added three different ethnic studies high school courses with 18 different class offerings this year, partnered with the major university in ethnic studies, created a culturally and linguistically relevant committee to support teacher pedagogy, added ethnic studies as a high school requirement. We had an adoption of the new um, English Learner Master Plan. We've consciously elevated the voices of our Latinx family community. And on September 21st, we'll be hosting our first community collaborative with different community partners and organizations. Over the years, we have moved along, but we still have much more to do to honor and celebrate our Latinx community. So this evening, um, I'm, bringing in for, I'm bringing forward the resolution, I'll read part of it. Uh, whereas um, understanding Latinx history and culture is an important part of celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. Whereas the term Latinx refers to people of Latin American origin regardless of race or language, and according to the 2010 census, 50.5 million people, or 16% of the United States of America population of, of this or origin, I heard um, a statistic uh, this week that 40% of the population of California is now of Latinx descent. Um, whereas the Pajo Valley Unified School District recognizes the significant contributions and considerable advances that Latinx Americans have made and continue to make in our community, state, and the world in such areas as education, medicine, art, culture, public services, economics, and development, politics, and human rights. We see the greatness of America and those who have risen above injustice and enriched our society. Therefore, be it resolved that the Pajo Valley Unified School District continues to partner with our community for events and to provide activities in the classroom where students talk about their identity and culture to continue the historical traditions that have been part of our community and in families since the inception. Be it resolved that Pajaro Valley Unified School District will acknowledge supports needed for our families, including farm workers, to ensure that our children of our family have access to equitable educational opportunities. 
Therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District will highlight local Mexican artists, cultural artists, storytellers, historians, and intentionally use literature that reflects our students whenever possible. And therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District proclaims September 15th through October 15th, 2021 as Latin X Heritage Month and is pleased to share in this special annual tribute by learning and celebrating the generations of Latinx who have positively influenced and enriched our nation and our society. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No public speakers. Any discussion from the board? Just really Trustee. quickly. Sure. You know, one of the things that I'm so proud of this board and just PBUSD in general is that we take our resolutions very seriously. Um, it's not just a resolution, but there's action items that go along with that, and part of those action items um, reflect community input, um, and we follow through on them. So thank you so much for just the amount of work that's been put into this resolution, but then also to those action items that you have already put in place. Um, um, so, just wanted to uh, to say that, um, and I would be proud to make a motion to approve this item tonight. Okay. Uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. Um, I totally like to echo what Trustee Orozco said. A lot of these resolutions we get from the people of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Uh, so we're listening. You know, we 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 take the wording because this is. This is the, these resolutions are from the constituents, from Aptos all the way to Watsonville, Pajaro, uh, Las Lomas. And I just had a, a quick question. Um, how long have we been, uh, how, how long has this resolution been going on for? So um, in board docs, uh, the first year was actually the year prior in 2016, where Dr. Rodriguez presented the, the resolution. But I could not find anything before then, so and I that and I cannot re recall if I'm sure it was in 2015, but I did not have could not find it in board docs. Okay. I, I'd just like to say thank you for bringing this resolution up, uh, Superintendent Rodriguez, and then I also like to say. Uh, I'd also like to mention Federico Castaneda's name mm -hmm. in this resolution because when, when I first got placed here, he also wanted me to make sure that we recognize this and I just wanted to say um, thank you Federico Castaneda to make sure that we celebrate this. So thank you very much and I'd like to second Trustee of Roscoe's motion. Right, thank you. Trustee DeSerpa? I think I, I actually brought the first resolution of this kind to the district and it was it's not something I thought of myself I actually saw the board agenda for one of the school districts over the hill and I thought that is a great idea and we need to do it so and it was b long before we had board docs <laughs> so anyway um, thank you very much and it's beautiful what Maria said yeah all right uh, we do. We do. Uh, Vice President Shocker? I just want to make a comment. Um, you know, as Trustee Rosker said, we take our resolutions seriously and we do action items that go along with our resolutions. And I think it's really important, um, especially nowadays, that the district is taking cultural relevancy very seriously. And we're making sure that all voices are heard, all cultures are heard. And uh, I thank you, Ms. Deserpa, for bringing this forward. <laughs> and I'm proud of PVUSD is continuing this tradition and acting on their resolutions. So thank you. All right, we have a first and a second. If there's no further comments, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, and now for uh, item 8.9, our membership agreement with Lemelson MIT, and the report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you. So I'm really excited about this um, partnership. So um, the board saw at the last board meeting a video of one of our students. He actually wound up winning at the global competition that night. Um, and so um, we have a lot of um, schools that now are engaged in the Invention Convention. Um, it started at um, Watsonville Charter School of the Arts and has now expanded um, to 
to other elementary schools. This, um, because of our dedication to um, the Invention Convention, um, Lemonson MIT um, reached out to us and said we'd like to partner with the school district. So again, um, others outside of the school district recognizing the strong work that we're doing. I talk about external validation all the time. This is another example of external validation. This would allow um, our teachers who are using um, Title II funding, so it's not out of general fund. Title II funding is specifically for professional development. This will allow us to send an unlimited number of teachers to the summer professional development in Massachusetts at MIT. Um, what you'll see that also is important, so they have what's called Invention Adventures, which is what we call Invention Convention. The, the other two areas that I think are really important um, is that there is a junior varsity um, Inven teams for grades six through 10. I want us to start um, doing some of this work um, with our middle schoolers. And then there is um, two things for high school, but the one I want to mention is the Invention and Inclusive Inventions, I3 um, curriculum, that is for high schoolers. Um, and so um, I think this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to um, collaborate with a really strong um, STEM partner such as MIT, and so I'm asking for the board's approval of this agenda item. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? No public speakers. All right. Any discussion from the board? Yeah, Roscoe? Yeah, I have a question. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there's four different categories here: PK, through eighth, ninth through twelve, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so does this mean that um, if we were to approve this tonight, the partnership would extend through our pre-kinder through 12th grade That's schools, correct. including mm -hmm. our dependent charter schools? Uh, yes, all of our dependent charter schools, yes. Great. Yep. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Trustee oh. DeSerpo? <laughs> Okay. No, go. I just was going to say to Dr. Aragres' point about wanting to work with a junior high. Um, EA Hall has a great migrant head start has worked. I've visited their lab and they have a great and you've been there too with me, right? Before. And they have a great team of students that do all kinds of fun stuff. I mean, they've taken things with egg beaters and have to transform the old-fashioned egg beaters into a working car, let's say. So I think this would be a, a great program to really get them involved in and see what they can do. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Did we have a motion yet on this? Sorry, Did we have a motion? Not yet. Okay, I'll well, like I'd like motion. to make a motion to approve this. I'm. Um, as most people know, a huge supporter of um, science education, and I'm very excited about this collaborative effort to bring more um, rich opportunities for kids to be involved in science, so thank you for bringing it forward. It's very exciting. And I've got a first. Do I have a second? I'll second. Great, and, and, and thank you. This is, you know, when I was reading about this on the agenda, it was like, oh, this is fun. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Um, if there's no further comments, I will call the vote. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. President Holm, before we move on to our next item, I'd like to make a motion to extend um, our meeting to 11 o'clock p.m. All right. I'll all second. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries 6-1. So, going on to item 8.10, uh, agreement between Pajaro Valley Unified School District and El Sistema uh, report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, as we have noted, um, we noted in the extend, in the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant, we had five different partnerships that were included um, in the approval of that plan. One of them was El Sistema. Um, and so, I'm really excited about this expansion for, for multiple reasons. Um, one, we have had it at four sites now um, for the last couple of years. and 
had um, really good um, results from it, everywhere from Duncan Holbert with our three-year-olds um, to um, our original school of Radcliffe. Um, it's also at Minty White and um, Valencia. This will allow us to do a couple of things that I think we, the board has been asking for and use one-time monies to get it done. One is to put it at four additional schools, so we're going to now be able to have it at a total of eight schools. Um, and then and then the second, which is probably um, equally exciting because we don't have this currently, is the creation of an orchestra. So we are going to be having a youth orchestra, which will be housed at EA Hall, but as you will see if you look at the agreement, um, it includes um, our all of our middle schools. Um, so it is students who are coming from uh, various band programs, um, various LC STEMA programs, and they're going to be able to have orchestra um, support. Um, and this is all, again, about building our arts program so that we have students when they get to the high school that want to engage in um, not only um, you know marching band which we're going to have um, marching band um, but are also orchestras which are the ones that um, generally um, accompany um, when you're doing some type of play or production um, and so um, this is all using um, expanded learning opportunity funds so none of it is is coming out of um, general fund, and I ask you to support LC Stema, please. Are there any public speakers to this item? No. Are there any comments from the board? Mm -hmm. Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, just a lot of great things happening in E Hall. Thank you, Superintendent Rodriguez, for making everything go full speed ahead. And I'd like to make a motion to support this program. And people are always asking, "What the marching band? The marching band?" It's coming. Right. You know, so you know, you're making that vision happen. So thank you very much. Anyone else? I know for 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 me, it's um, wanting this for my kids as they were going through was a big you know motivating factor for you know for what got me here. Yeah. And I know for myself as a kid, you know, I ended up in, in orchestra in junior high accidentally. Did not want to be in it. <laughs> but I got put in it because my first choice wasn't there. And I was so mad. And then it fundamentally changed my life. And, you know, I ended up continuing on with music all through junior high, all through high school, and into college. And it taught me so much, you know, in the way that sports can teach kids about, you know, teamwork and being part of something bigger than just yourself. I found that in music. And the, the part about playing, you know, simple notes, but in conjunction with, you know, 40 other kids playing other notes, you, you had music. And so seeing these programs develop and grow, it just, it, 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 it brings me joy. And it brings me joy not just for my own you know, reflections, but for what we can accomplish in our district. So, so thank you. Uh, Vice President Shocker. Yes, well, first I'd like to make a motion to approve. We have a motion. Would you like to second? A second a motion. Yes, yes sorry. And um, I'd just like to say that, yes, this is something that is so needed, and I'm so happy that we're finally getting to have an orchestra and a marching band. And I know many students who are interested and are going to be happy um, to hear this and realize that they're going to be able to one day play in an orchestra or be in the marching band, which so many of them want to do. And El Sistema is one of my f ultimate favorite programs, and it's my favorite part of the year. And I missed that during COVID, <laughs> seeing those kids' faces live, um, playing their songs and showing off their instrument skills. So I look forward to being able to see their little faces again soon. Thank you. Yeah, I have a quick question. Sure. Well, a comment and a question. So I'm, look, I'm looking at the backup materials. It's nice to see that we're including all middle schools, high schools, and uh, even our continuation schools and virtual academy. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice to see that uh, we're not excluding anyone. Um, how, how, how is, um, I, I, logistically speaking, how would this work? So we would have 
an orchestra class in each of these schools, and then well, how would it be run, I guess? So what they would do is they would all come to EA Hall for that um, collaborative work. Eventually, we will get ourselves to the point where we do have enough students in order to be able to have individual orchestras. But because of the number of um, members of the orchestra that you need to have a true orchestra, we need to combine the various schools. Eventually, we'll be able to have multiple orchestras. Um, but because you have to have so many, uh, you know, on wind instruments and and all the various um, sections of the orchestra, um, they will be provided transportation. So if you okay. look at the fees and costs, one of it is um, is the transportation mm. is being we'll provided see. for our children from their school of residence to EA Hall. So we're not depending on a parent to provide the transportation. We're providing the transportation very similar to we do for extended learning. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah I missed that, but yes, it's here. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Well, I'm in full support. Anything that has to do with arts and music, I'm all for. Are there any other comments? Hearing none, I'll, I'll call for the vote since we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we'll move on to item 8.11, Margaret Lapiz of the Family Engagement and Wellness Center, our site services agreement. Dr. Yeah. Rodriguez? Thank you very much. So we have an accelerated timeline um, trying to ensure that we can open the um, Family Engagement and Wellness Center at EA Hall prior to the close um, for winter break. Um, and so as you are aware, um, we do now have a, um, a direct of um, counseling services. However, because we have had um, vacancies um, and have not filled um, the AP positions at Watsonville High, um, our direct, our coordinator, our coordinator of um, counseling services has not been able to support this effort. Um, and so Margaret Lapis is um, part of the Under One Roof initiative and is also support, one of the um, supporters of NowPal. This will allow, again, using expanded opportunity grant monies because it's linked to the introduction of the Family Engagement and Wellness Centers. This will allow us to collaborate with our three key partners, um, and she will be the conduit to help um, to ensure that these groups get off and up and running. Um, it will require a facilitation, a weekly facilitation of three separate subgroups. Um, and right now we really do not have staff that can um, help with this extensive coordination. Um, and so Margaret has been there a along the way and, um, and so we, she would be supporting this so that we can ensure that we open um, prior to the middle of December um, because we know our families need the support. Um, she'll be coordinating with um, Salud para la Gente. So I'm part of one of the th sub groups, I'm the leadership subgroup, but she'll be working with me um, with Salud para la Gente, PVPSA, and Collective Action Board. And so those are our first three key partners um, that we are bringing in um, to get this off the ground, and we're excited to be able to provide a one-stop shop for our families. Thank you. Do we have any comments, or any public comments? Sorry. No public comments. Any discussion from the board? All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Um, just really quick. Oh, sure. So it's great to see that this is coming together. I know Trustee Shaka and I, when we made that motion, um, this was very important, very important part, a key component of that motion that we made to uh, really address the social emotional needs of the entire family, not just the student. Um, I guess my, my only question would be, so once this, um, the wellness centers in place, what type of outreach will we be doing to families so that they know that they can access those services? Because I think that's where the disconnect happens. Um, it's easier when a student is referred and maybe has someone that walks them through that process. But um, for the larger community, um, I guess I would want to have a plan in place for what those outreach efforts will look like. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think that's exactly why we chose the three partners that we have. Okay. Um, so when you think about where our most vulnerable families are, the ones that likely will not step onto our campuses to receive those supports, um, the ones that they go to really are Salupa de Gente for their medical mm -hmm. needs, um, PVPSA for their social emotional, and then CAB for their wraparound services. Um, I mean, I'm so impressed with just the outreach and the work that CAB does with even our homeless youth mm -hmm. and some of our most vulnerable population. Um, we are, something that's gonna be different about the wellness centers is the time that it's open. So we're actually gonna have it open um, in the evening evenings and mid mid afternoons too but in the evenings and on weekends that's great um, because what we believe is true is some of the families that we're not able to access it's not due to them not knowing about the services but not being able to get to the services mm -hmm. when they need to be there versus when we're open um, and so um, I think with the outreach of the partners that we have um, that will, families that a lot of times we don't access will wind up um, receiving. Um, I think we're gonna have the opposite problem actually. I think we're gonna have so many people that want those services that we're gonna need to open our second um, family engagement and wellness center right quick after that. Um, but we'll definitely do um, major outreach reach um, for our families um, and they can be referred so through the NowPow system that you guys approved mm -hmm. um, whether it's a teacher or um, it's a staff member or a parent themselves they can refer themselves and the key part is now all the partners will be able to see it Great. So a lot of times, like I, I, I say to PVPSA, here's a family, please support. We don't really know what happens with that family afterwards. Mm. And now we're all going to be able to see, I mean, there's still going to be FERPA and confidentiality, yeah. but we'll at least be able to see, oh, they saw them four times. That's, that's we won't great. be able to see the content of it, but we'll be able to see that. And there are permissions. I mean, they will have to give us permission to share that information, but I think it will be really fantastic for our families. Yeah, I'm very excited. Um, and um, just one last question, all services will be free, right? Um, from our parent engagement and wellness mm -hmm. centers? Yes, absolutely. Great. Yep. Thank you for that. Yep. I'll entertain a motion. I'm sorry. I'm ready to make a motion. I'm not president. <laughs> but I'll help you make a motion <laughs> to approve this item. Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, I also say, like to say thank you, you know, Trustee Shankamir, this was your, your vision for the conversation that we had a while ago. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Rodriguez, at putting it in EA Hall. I know there's a lot of partners in that area. You know, EA Hall, Erika Padilla at PVPSA, Maria Elena Garza at CAB. Um, you know, we also have WIC downtown. Um, it used to be called La Manzana Center. I forgot what it is now, but you know, the, those services can help refer people to that center. And I, it's like I keep bringing up, a lot of those schools, 60 to 70% of people walk. Radcliffe, E. Hall, Mini White, and so I, I think it's great in a centralized location, and I keep trying to tell the people, you know, there's a lot of good things going on at E. Hall, and you know, thank you for making that happen. I'm glad to be part of it, and you know, thank for the board for putting this all together and just trying to get as many people as we can to these sites. So I'm not sure if there was a second, but I, uh, if I can second the motion, I'd like to second. Thank you. Trustee DeSerpa, did you have a comment? As usual, I do have a comment. Um, as somebody who's worked in clinics right alongside doctors and other ancillary services, um, I think this will be a huge um, benefit to our community and to our families. It's sort of a one-stop shop where they could get everything, all their needs met from their medical needs to mental health to resources. And so I couldn't support this more. So thank you for everybody who made it happen. It, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. And, I, and also thank you to the community partners who stepped forward to help us with this. And, you know, indeed there will be billing 
selling and there will be some revenue and sustainability um, built into this model but um, it's a wonderful um, wonderful that we can provide this right there on the on the campuses of our um, schools so thank you to everybody anyone else yes all right, Trustee Shocker. So just to touch on a point um, Trustee Roscoe made, we're talking about um, this opening and facilitating services, and we're probably going to be very busy. So would Margaret, since we want to expand sooner, is that something we can look at utilizing Margaret also for expansion of the second center to get the ball rolling with that? Yeah, she's she's already going to start um, a little bit of that groundwork. I need to do some work with the community just to so that we have spoken with the community when we select the second location. Um, but we can definitely um, bring this back as well. Um, but I, I know it will be a success, the first one. And we could expand it um, so that she can help with the second as well. Because I know, um, just especially now, you know, with COVID and everything that families are going through, it's. I think it's important that we get it off the ground as soon sure. as possible. And um, if Margaret's going to make that happen, then I support that. So thank, thank you. you. All right. Well, we have a first and a second. I'll call the vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we will move on to section nine, our report and discussion items. Um, item 9.1, our local performance indicator reflection report, presented by Lisa Aguirre. Good evening again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm closing out this evening in terms of reports, and so um, hopefully we can make it good. Um, so all uh, school districts, local education agencies, uses the State Board of Education approved reflection tool um, for school districts to report their uh, progress in five different areas. These five different areas are the basic services, implementation of academic standards, implementation of broad course of study, parent engagement, and school climate. This evening I'm going to be presenting a summary of the report. Um, eventually the report itself along with uh, different data points in terms of academic and um, student uh, behavior will be placed on the California dashboard. So the first thing um, with this reflection tool, um, it is used um, to do a, a reflection analysis of how we are doing and then it, the information must be presented um, to both the public and also um, all stakeholders. It is the five indicators that I did um, previously mention. The first thing is the basic services. So this was for last year, where we look at if our teachers were appropriately assigned that we had within the classroom, 100% of our teachers were. Um, Williams comes through, the Williams from the County Office of Education. They look at our facilities as well as our instructional materials. 100% um, of our uh, Williams sites had the instructional materials needed. And then they also look at our facilities. So we had, um, within, we had 99 checkpoints where facilities did not meet um, good standard. And this is what's reported. But those 99 come from 3,973, which means that 97.5% of the check mar marks made the good standard. So what you see in the, the report is just the 99, but when you look at the big picture of how many actual check marks there were, it paints a different picture. So I did want to re um, report that out. The second thing is the implementation of state academic standards. And so we look at this, um, we, we reflect on the professional development for teachers with the new curriculum. We also look to ensure that our instructional materials are aligned with state standards. Um, we look to see how we are doing with um, supporting our staff um, with implementation of the state standards, um, looking at the courses that we offer as well as um, how do we identify different professional opportunities needed for um, our teaching staff. So within the reflection, um, one of the things that we started last year during the pandemic, um, we really enhanced it, was the instructional coaches um, drop in hours. This is something that we found to be highly effective and that we are continuing it, even though that we're back in person. It was utilized greatly by our teaching staff throughout, um, throughout the district. Um, the coaching cycles with the core curriculum, this is not only to implement the um, new curriculum, any new um, board adopted curriculum, but also our current 
curriculum in looking at what we um, found is that we are able to identify individual teacher professional development needs. This is one of the things that the um, report asks us to reflect on is how are we identifying individual teacher needs. This is one way that we, we do that. Implementation of the next generation science standards. This was an area that we rated ourselves lower in only because this is um, the, the next generation science standards came after the common core standards. We've um, had a new adoption in both the middle school as well as biology. Our next steps is um, the adoption, a formal adoption in chemistry, physics, and elementary. And then we're going to continue the articulation of high school signature um, CTE pathways. And you've heard a lot about that. Um, priority three is the parent and family engagement. Uh, through last year, the pandemic, um, some of the highlights that we saw is that our parent engagement team, um, Director Michael Berman and his team really found ways to um, reach out to our parent community to increase the two-way communication. They had uh, a lot of different, they tried a lot of different things, figured out what worked, and we had a really high percentage um, of population of our, uh, per population of percentage um, of our families in different meetings and getting feedback. And so this is something that we will continue to hold virtual meetings and not require them all to be in person because it, this was something that we learned worked. The other thing is that we um, figured out how to get resources to in our houses. For some reason, you know, in the past, we would send some things home, and then we realized when we needed to, we could get resources home quickly to students. And so this is also something that we will continue. Um, and within this, the parent and family engagement, and it was the team that really reflected on looking at how we're doing as um, an organization to determine our needs and um, our strengths is really having the professional, continue the professional development where, um, so that all of our sites where parents walk onto the campus and they feel respected and they feel like a partner. In um, the Youth Truth, we did found that with our parent, um, with our parent community, that's one of the things that they wasn't consistent throughout the, the district, that this was a need. So this is something that we're looking at continuing our professional development. And that goes with the trusting, respectful relationships. And then also the last bullet is really talking about how together, and it's not something where it's just the school district decides this is what our community needs, but really partnering with our parents to determine how we're going to co-develop the different opportunities that we can um, have for our, our community. The sixth priority area is the school climate. Um, the Healthy Kids Survey, which is given every other year, um, except because of the pandemic closure, the last um, Healthy Kids survey was out in 2019. We are due um, this year to have that again. And then um, our Youth Choose survey, and that's where we look at the different indicators in terms of connectedness, caring, adult relationships, and that whether um, schools are perceived safe. So looking at the reflection, um, that in general, um, in all grades, they felt that they were a part of their community, students in both in elementary, middle, and high school. Um, student perception of fair discipline is not as high as we would like. Um, within the report, I did break it out a little bit in terms of demographics when there was a larger percentage. Um, and as you can um, um, possibly guess that in elementary, um, it was a little higher than middle than in high school. Uh, but we have over the years increased and we continue to increase to add different uh, programs on our school campuses from El Sistema to um, the Latino, the Youth Cinema Project to the um, Life Lab and a lot of different opportunities as well as our PBIS implementation. Last year we had 26 schools recognized by the state of California for the PBIS implementation. So it's showing that the work that we're doing is being recognized and um, is growing and helping. And then the last thing, we really look at the access to a broad course of study. So what this means is that there's a variety of classes that are offered, a variety of subject areas in the elementary classes within the middle school and high school. And so it's having the opportunity to ensure that all of our students have access to a broad access course of study. And so it's at the end of the year reflecting, looking at where are we possibly missing some students, what do we not have enough of, and so adding different programs has um, enhanced the visual and performing arts and the sciences at the elementary level as well as the middle and also the high school level. 
Um, one of the things that we are still working on is the secondary master schedules. The traditional six period day has some limitations in terms of what students can take throughout their day because if it's a limited six period. So that's one of the things that we are looking at on how we can ensure that all of our students have access to a broad course of study. If uh, within the LCAP that was brought um, a few months ago, um, there are lots of goals and actions which does address the broad course of study in ensuring that all of our students do have access to AP courses as well as AD, ELD courses as well as visual and performing arts courses. So it's really making sure that each year we have that reflection cycle and I think the LCAP does support all of us looking at to ensure that um, our students have that broad course of study. So with that, that was the condensed version of the document that was prepared. <laughs> Great. Do Thank we have you very much? Do you have any questions? Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No public speakers. Any discussion from the board? Thank you. Okay, Trustee Orozco. Sorry, guys. It's all right. Um, I thought it was 10. It's only 9. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, going back to the seventh period, is the goal to eventually move our, all of our high school towards um, that type of schedule? That's one of the things that we could look at doing, but it would take a partnership with the school and the um, school employees as well as the district to see if it's a right fit for that school. We do find that at Aptos High, where there is a seven period day, that students do have a larger, um, they have more opportunities to access classes. And has that conversation started with Watsonville? Maybe it, it has, it has over the years, and uh, we, uh, it has not yet been successful in being implemented. Okay. And right, it's a continued discussion. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, going back to the parent engagement piece, um, at least from many of the meetings that I've attended, I think one of the major um, issues raised by especially our um, Spanish-speaking families is um, even at DLAC meetings and so forth, we, we often throw a lot, a lot of information at parents, uh, but we're not, we not always check to see that they're understanding it. And I feel like that's a huge disconnect. And so I think that would be, um, if we could focus in, in bridging that gap, I think that would uh, definitely uh, improve the connection that we have with families. Okay. Um, so that was just an observation and from, you know, as many DLAG meetings I've attended and just community meetings, that's, I think that's something that uh, parents have expressed a lot. Um, so just to keep that in mind uh, moving forward. Okay, and our parent engagement team loves to try new things and work out new things, so I'm sure they will, by next month it'll be implemented. Yeah, and um, a question that I have when, um, when we receive uh, inquiries from parents um, who do not speak English, is there usually a, someone that um, they're present to translate? Yes, there, there should be someone there to translate and we also have access to the language line. We um, implement that and we have it again this year. So we do not, we should not have any barriers to the, the to, with language. Great. Spoken. Okay, well those were my, my comments. Anyone else? Uh, Trustee Shocker. Um, just to go touch on what Maria was saying um, about parent engagement, um, one of the comments I've received a lot from parents is, I get so many emails from PVUSD that I've stopped reading them. Um, and so sometimes they're not as informed as they should be, so maybe looking at some kind of alternate um, form of communication to condense our emails better, where parents will start reading our emails. Um, that's a big question for the parent engagement team to tackle. And then other question was back to the 99 sites that didn't meet the good. Right. Was 99 that for checkpoints. 99 checkpoints. Was that for facilities? So that's overall an entire district out of 3,975, I believe, checkpoints. Okay. So I could be wrong. Let's see. So, so each school site, depending on um, what you have on that 3,973 checkpoints. So each school site has anywhere from 45 to 79-ish checkpoints. And so then that's all added up. 
So depending on the size of your facility is how many different things are looked at when the Williams goes through. Okay, so for anything that came up facilities wise, can we look at that, you know, how we had our meeting in July with ESSER funds about prioritizing certain things with facilities. Can we look at that list and kind of get mm -hmm. an idea of what needs to be prioritized at sites? Okay, that's it, thank you. Anyone else? Did you say out loud what the two were that were considered poor? The two sites? The two sites? Yeah. Yeah. I or fair, sorry. It was, let's see. Sorry. I will, I will have that for you. Okay. So I don't have to thumb through. Yeah, mostly. Just curious. And um, sadly, we only have one school in exemplary condition. Do you know what school that was? It's really difficult to get an exemplary um, exemplary mark, and I'll also get that for you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You can put that in the B2B. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Thank you. All right. Well, Lisa, thank you very much. All right. So we will move on to um, Section 10, our consent agenda. And that's our routine items. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? We do not, President Hall. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? All right, in that case, can I have a motion? I'll move to approve. I'll second. All right, so I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries uh, 601. All right, so my apologies. Um, so we're not reconvening closed session. We're going to do item 13.1, our action and report on closed session items. Are there any items to report from closed session? Yes, I do. Thank you. So for first item, motion one for closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on September 8th, 2021 with six and five additional action items. Can I'll second. Okay, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, 601. Okay. For motion two, closed session item 2.2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on September 8th, 2021 with 15 and nine additional action items. I'll second. First and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. For item 2.5, settlement agreement for special education student, the board approved a settlement agreement for a special education student with a 502 vote. All right. So uh, our next meeting will be the special board meeting on September 15th, uh, uh, 2021, beginning at 6 p.m. at EA Hall, unless there are issues but we will definitely post our location on Friday. And with that, the meeting is adjourned at 922.